Uh, I want to begin today. Uh, I want to begin today with the Aaron Fest relations, uh, which are one of the ways of understanding the classical and the quantum mechanics. Uh, to be specific, we'll deal with a uh, Hamiltonian in three dimensions, which is a kinetic plus potential Hamiltonian, common case like this, uh, 3D. Uh, and I'd like to begin by uh, writing down the Heisenberg equations of motion uh, for this Hamiltonian. So the equations of motion are that x dot is minus i h bar times the commutator of x with the Hamiltonian. Similarly, the time derivative of the momentum operator is minus i h bar times the commutator of the momentum of the Hamiltonian. And this is the, these are the Heisenberg equations of motion. And uh, uh, so it, it's understood that these operators x and p and the Hamiltonian also uh, are all in the Heisenberg picture, although I didn't put any other subscripts on them. Uh, I'll remind you that in general, there's another term involving an explicit time dependence. You have know, like a partial of x with respect to t, but um, since uh, x, both x and p uh, have no explicit time dependence, those extra terms don't appear. This is all there is for the Heisenberg equations of motion. Now, in order to evaluate these uh, commutators on the right hand side, well, we need to do that to get the equations of motion explicitly. Let's notice that the kinetic energy is a function only of the momentum, whereas the potential energy is a function only of position. So the position operator commutes with the potential, but not with the kinetic energy. And likewise, or conversely, the momentum operator commutes with the kinetic energy, but not with the momentum. So to evaluate these commutators, there are some, uh, there are some commutator results that are useful to use for this, which I'll cite for you here. If we take the commutator of one of the components of position, with some function of momentum, I'll call it f of p. Uh, the result is i h bar times the derivative of f with respect to ti. Likewise, if we take the commutator of one of the components of momentum with another function, which I'll call g, of position, the answer is minus i h bar partial g with respect to x of i. And uh, these are results which I won't prove. Uh, I'll leave as an exercise for you. I'll just remark that uh, you can prove them by going back to the definition of a function of an operator, which was presented uh, in the uh, first set of notes in the mathematical section of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the, of the notes. Uh, in any case, using these commutators, the, these, uh, those general commutators, these specific ones are easy to work out, and they turn into this, that x dot, is equal to the minus i h bar cancels with the plus i h bar here, and uh, what you end up with is x dot is just equal to the uh, momentum p divided by the mass, and you have p dot is equal to the minus the gradient of the potential evaluated at the position x, like this. And so these are the Heisenberg equations of motion for a particle moving in a, in a potential in three dimensions. What's striking about these equations is, is that they have exactly the same form as uh, the uh, uh, classical Hamilton's equations in classical mechanics. Uh, the, if just with the reinterpretation of symbols, this is the same as classical Hamiltonian. Hamilton's classical equations are that x dot is equal to the derivative of h with respect to momentum, and that p dot uh, is equal to minus the derivative of h with respect to position which for this particular Hamiltonian gives you p over m for x dot and minus the gradient of v for p dot, which is a function of x. And so they have, they're exactly the same equations. Well, they're not the same really because these equations are operator equations. These are the time-dependent operators in the Heisenberg picture. So these are things that act in this infinite dimensional cat space. Whereas these equations involve numbers. These are what you might call C-number equations, uh, the classical equations. The vectors here are vectors of ordinary numbers and not of operators. These can be regarded as Q number equations, where I'm using Dirac's terminology distinguishing between Q numbers and P numbers. But still, it's striking they have exactly the same form. It's just reinterpretation of the symbols takes the classical equations into the Heisenberg quantum equations. All right. Now, um, we can take these Q number or Heisenberg quantum equations and convert them into C number equations just by taking expectation values with respect to some state. So let's say we have a state, let's call it psi. I'll put an H subscript on it because it's in the Heisenberg picture. And let's take these Heisenberg equations and sandwich them 
between psi h on the both sides in order to get expectation values. So if we do this, uh, let's start with the x dot up here at the top of the Heisenberg equations. If we do this, then we get psi h on the left, x dot in the middle. Uh, let me write it as d t of x to make it more explicit. And the x, I'll put an h on, us, on it to remind us that we're, in, that we're in the Heisenberg picture. So for the x dot term, this is the expectation value we get. <clears throat> now the Heisenberg bras and cats are independent of time. So the ddt can be taken out. And this becomes then ddt of the expectation value in the Heisenberg picture of just the x operator. Like this. <clears throat> However, I'll remind you that expectation values are the same in both the Schrodinger and the Heisenberg pictures. So this is the same thing as ddt of psi Schrodinger, x Schrodinger, psi, psi Schrodinger, like this completely in Schrodinger picture, in which now, of course, the time becomes shifted over to the, uh, to the Kets, the Kets and the Bras, and the XS is now time independent. Let's just abbreviate this by writing as just DDT of the expectation value of X without being specific which picture it is, because it doesn't matter which picture it is. All right, so let's do this then. Let's take this Psi H bra Ket and sandwich it on both sides of both these equations. These are the Heisenberg equations in motion. And if we do this, it turns into C number equations, which I'll write out right out here. So the first one becomes DDT, of the expectation value of X, is equal to the expectation value of momentum divided by mass. The second one becomes DDT, of the expectation value of momentum, is equal to, is equal to minus the average value, or expectation value, of the gradient of velocity as a function of position like this. So these are the expectation value equations we get. So by this procedure, we've converted the Q number equations into C number equations, and the classical equations are C number equations. So are these new equations the same as the classical equations now? And the answer is no, because um, it has to do with this potential energy. The reason is, is that the average value of the but the expectation value of the gradient of the potential of x is, in general, not the same thing as, with a minus sign here, the gradient of the potential evaluated at the expectation value of x. Those aren't the same thing. If they were the same thing, then with the classical x's and p's replaced by expectation values, uh, both being c, both c num vectors and c numbers, then we would have exactly the same equations. And then we could say that the expectation values in the quantum problem follow the classical motion. But because these two, ex these, two think these two terms are not equal, in general, that's not true. You'll hear people say the Ehrenfest relations say that expectation values follow the classical motion. And that's actually not true in general for the reason I just pointed out. All right. Nevertheless, it is approximately true under some circumstances, which I'll now explain. So the circumstances are this. Uh, let me sketch a potential energy as a of x like this. Let's say we've got some, uh, uh, let's say we've got some potential, uh, uh, no, excuse me. Uh, let me do it this way. Uh, what, we, what appears here is the gradient of the potential, so it's a vector. It has three components. That's, of course, classically the force. Uh, let me take a function, let me just call it a function of x, f of x like this which could be uh, any of the components of the force. And let's say it's got some, it's got some shape like this. All right. <clears throat> now, let's suppose that the wave, so this is the, this is the function f of x. I'll sketch this in one dimension, although the equations here are three dimensions, three dimensional. Now, let's suppose the wave function of x is a wave packet, which is localized. Let's say this is psi of x like this. Uh, and the way I've drawn it is, is that the psi of x, the spatial extent of the wave packet, is small compared to the scale length of this function f. Anyway, the expectation value of, of, of the position of operator x is just sort of the center of the wave packet. Let's call it x0 here. x0 is the same thing as the expectation value of, of x, which is an integral of dx of the square of the wave function psi uh, times x itself. Let's call that x0. And if we look over the extent of the wave packet, 
the potential is almost constant over this, over this, because it's a small interval, the potential is almost constant over it. And so it's clear from the diagram that the average value of f of x is approximately equal to f evaluated at the average value of x under the circumstances that I've sketched here, just for the graph. We can be more quantitative about this, however. We can take, uh, we can take the expectation value of f of x. This is the integral over x of the square of the wave function psi, psi squared times f of x. And uh, since we're only interested in the small range of x's around the center of the wave packet, let's expand f of x about that point x0 and replace it by f of x0 plus x0, x minus x0 times f prime of x0 plus second order terms, which I won't bother to write out. Then I'm doing this, uh, then now we'll do the integral over this uh, series expansion of the function f. Yeah, we're expanding the slowly varying function, you see. Well, the first term f of x0 is a constant, so when you do the integral, you can take the f of x0 out of the integral. What's left is just the integral of psi squared, which is 1, so the first term is just f of x0 itself. As far as the second term is concerned, again, f prime of x0 and x0 are constants that will be taken out of the integral. As far as the x itself here, you've got, you've got integral of psi squared times x. Well, that's the same thing as x0. It's the expectation value of x. So what happens on doing the integral is that x gets replaced by x0. x0 minus x0 is 0. And the entire first order term vanishes. It goes away. So even if I took into account the slope of the, of the function, I have to still get a 0 here. And the, the, the first non-zero corrections are at quadratic order, which I won't bother to write them out, but there's quadratic corrections here. And so what we see then is, is that to summarize then, is that the average value of f of x is equal to the is equal to f evaluated at the average. The average value of f of x is f evaluated at the average value of x plus quadratic corrections. So that this, this inequality here is actually a good approximation if the wave function, let's call it a wave packet because it's, because it's localized, uh, has a spatial extent small compared to the scale length of the potential. And in that case, we could then approximately replace that expectation value with that one. And the result will be is that approximately the expectation values uh, in the quantum problem do follow the classical orbits. At least this is an approximation. All right. Now, a further remark here is that um, there are some circumstances in which the approximation is exact. And it's easy to see what they are, because if the function f, I sketched it here as being kind of a curve, but if the function f were a straight line, that would mean that its Taylor series expansion terminates at the first order. <coughs> so there wouldn't be any quadratic corrections. And this calculation we went through would be exact with f of x0 plus 0. And so for a linear function uh, of, of x, this, is, this, this relationship is exact. Now the function f that we're talking about here is interpreted in the board above as being one of the components of the gradient of f. That's to say it's the force. So if the force is a linear function of, f, of x, then this becomes an equality here. So let me go back to the old board here. Say that, and say that this becomes equals uh, this becomes an equal sign. Under certain conditions, the conditions are is that the, the components of the force are linear functions of position. This is a three-dimensional problem. If the force is a linear function of position, it means the potential is a quadratic function of position. So this will be true if the potential, V of x, this is now in three dimensions, has the, has the following form. I'm going to write down a general quadratic function of the, of the position coordinates x, y, and z. The sum of i and j of some matrix, let's call it aij of xi, xj. That's a quadratic term plus a linear term. All that is a sum on i of some coefficients of vi times xi plus a constant term c. And so if the potential has this form, it's a general quadratic polynomial of the coordinates x, y, and z, then the Aronfest relations are exact. Wave packets uh, or expectation values of the quantum wave functions do exactly follow the classical motion. And by the way, I almost had a verbal slip there because it doesn't even have to be a wave packet. You see, this condition holds regardless. It doesn't have to be a wave packet. This, if the termination, the expansion terminates in linear order, this is true for any wave function. 
And so, um, so for these types of potentials, expectation values always follow the classical notion. Now, this includes several problems of interest. In the first place, at the right-hand side is zero. You've got a free particle. In that case, for a free particle, uh, this is true. Expectations follow the classical motion. If we have the just the linear term here, that includes the case of a particle in the gravitational field, uniform gravitational field, or a charged particle in the uniform electric field. Or if we have the quadratic term, that of course includes harmonic oscillators of all kinds, because we've got three dimensions, and the matrix can be anything here, not just simple harmonic oscillators. I'll mention one more thing too, which I won't prove is that it can be shown that the error-crest relations, the expectation values uh, follow classical motions. In the general case, if the entire Hamiltonian is a quadratic an arbitrary quadratic function of position and, and, and uh, positions and momenta, including the momenta as well, where even cross terms, p times x's, are allowed. And that includes the important case of the particle in the uniform magnetic field. Although I won't prove it has to be true, the error-crest relations are exact there also. What are the Aaron Fest relations? The Aaron Fest relations are, uh, the Aaron relations would be uh, replacing the classical equations of motion by expectation values. Maybe I'm using it in a sloppy way because uh, I can refer to these equations as the Aaron Fest relations, which are exactly quantum mechanics. Uh, they do not, however, as I just was explaining, they do not, however, say that expectation values follow the classical motion unless this an equal sign can be replaced by a <coughs> which it can in this case. Right. All right. Uh, okay, so that's uh, all I want to say about Aaron Fest's uh, theorem or Aaron Fest relations. These are, as I say, one of the ways of understanding the classical limit of quantum mechanics in terms of, uh, of uh, evolution of expectation values. Now I'd like to say some things about uh, particles in magnetic fields. Uh, let me begin with the classical case of a particle in a, in a magnetic field. If a particle in charge Q in a magnetic field, uh, then the classical equations of motion are the, I call them the Newton-Lorentz equations. Force equals mass times acceleration, which is the charge Q multiplied times the electric field plus the velocity V over C crossed into the magnetic field. The electric and magnetic fields, of course, are allowed to be functions of space and time. Uh, and, uh, so this is a classical equation of motion. These equations can be derived from a classical Hamiltonian. The classical Hamiltonian is this. It's 1 over 2m, momentum p, minus q over c times the vector potential a, which in general is a function of position and time. And that whole thing is squared plus the charge Q times the scalar potential, which I'll call capital Phi, which is a, in general is also a function of position in time. Anyway, this is the this is the classical Hamiltonian for motion of a charged particle in a in a given, we might say external, given external electric and magnetic fields. Electric fields and magnetic fields are expressed in terms of the potential by E is minus gradient phi minus one over C D A D T standard results from electromagnetic theory, and B is equal to the kernel of A, like this. All right. One of the strange features of this classical Hamiltonian is that it's expressed in terms of potentials. Maybe that doesn't surprise you about the scalar potential, because you're used to potential energies. But now that you've got a magnetic field, you need the vector potential also. This is in contrast to the Newton-Lorentz equations of motion, which involve the electric and magnetic fields directly not the potentials, the relation being given by these lower equations. You have to use potentials, even in classical mechanics, if you want to uh, write down a Hamiltonian. Here's another uh, thing to uh, pay attention to. If we take the Hamilton's equations of motion, that x dot is, this whole board is classical here up to this point. x dot according to Hamilton's equations is dh dp, the momentum. And if you do the derivative here, what you get is 1 over m, times P minus Q over C A, the vector potential. And X dot, of course, is the velocity. So if we take this equation and we solve for the momentum as a function of the velocity, what we get is P is equal to the mass times the velocity plus Q over C times the vector potential, which in general depends on space and time. 
And so you can see right away that the momentum, which appears here in a classical Hamiltonian, is not the kinetic momentum, which is just the first term, but it's rather the canonical momentum, it's the whole thing. So pay attention to the difference between the kinetic momentum and the canonical momentum when you're dealing with problems where there's a vector potential. Of course, usually we don't have a vector potential unless there's a magnetic field around. So if there's no magnetic field, if B were equal to zero, most people would say, oh, let's take A equal to zero also, then we, then we can forget about this whole magnetic field vector potential stuff. Um, as we'll see in a couple of lectures, however, there's an, an interesting, uh, an, an interesting uh, um, physical situation. It's the aharonov bohm effect, in which we have a magnetic field equal to zero, and we have to take, a magnetic, we take the vector potential not equal to zero. So actually necessary to do in that case. So in any case, um, in any case, the uh, momentum here is the canonical momentum. By the way, once we do that, once you recognize that P is the canonical momentum where the velocity is given by this expression, there's another uh, immediate conclusion, which is that this entire first complicated term of the Hamiltonian, if I wrote it in terms of the velocity instead of the momentum, it becomes one half mv squared. The point is, this entire expression is a complicated way of writing the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is not p squared over 2m if there's a vector potential around. It's this whole expression. Physically, that's physical meaning of it. All right. Now, um, there's another uh, interesting, uh, another <coughs> point that I need to make, which is the potentials a and phi are not unique. Uh, if we take a function of position in time, the function, this is a, think of this as an arbitrary function. It's a function I'll call the gauge scalar. Using the gauge scalar, it's possible to convert old potentials into new ones. And the rules are this, is that A prime, the new potential, is equal to A plus the gradient of F. And phi prime, the new scalar potential, is equal to phi, the old scalar potential, minus one over C D F D T. These are the expressions for the gauge transformation in, in, in the standard, the standard the gauge transformation in uh, electromagnetic theory. But if you make these changes going from the unprimed to the primed or the old and the new potentials, what you find is the electric and magnetic fields are invariant. The primed and unprimed version of them are the same. Well, the electric and magnetic fields are directly measurable. In that sense, they're physical fields. You can, you can measure them by, by looking at the force on the charged particle. Um, but the fact that, uh, so they don't change. What's physical does not change under a gauge transformation. But the potentials, the potentials do change. And so the potentials have what we might say is a non-physical element. In fact, I think it's useful to think about the potentials this way, is to say that they contain both a non-physical element and a physical one. They contain the physical element because by taking derivatives of them, you get the measurable fields, which are A and B. But they contain a non-physical element, and that's what changes when you do a gauge transformation. So there's a redundant mathematical description of the single physical reality, which is the E and the B fields. And as I said, it's an interesting uh, fact that the Hamiltonian requires the use of the potentials. Another way of saying this is, is there's no such thing as a phi meter or an A meter. There's no way to measure phi or A with some kind of a meter. Well, you might say, oh, I've got a voltmeter. I can certainly measure the potential of the voltmeter, can't I? The voltmeter has two connections. It doesn't There is no voltmeter with just one wire. So you don't actually measure phi at one place, but you measure the difference in phi between two different places. By the way, that only, only works for static, or at least slowly varying. So it's only really only valid for like a static approximation anyway. But So I go back to the same statement, as there really is no such thing as a phi meter or an A meter. All right. Um, so that's some, uh, that's some review of classical uh, uh, electromagnetism uh, and, and motion of charged particles and so on. Now, um, what we do in quantum mechanics uh, is, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take this classical Hamiltonian, and just like we did with the kinetic plus potential Hamiltonian, we're going to uh, provisionally adopt this Hamiltonian as a quantum Hamiltonian by a reinterpretation of the symbols. The same issues arise, so in, without, without changing the formula, but just reinterpreting the symbols, this now becomes the quantum Hamiltonian. Uh, when we do this, of course, we have to ask if it's physically correct, 
Uh, I explained last time that this is this, we're talking here about a process of quantization. And uh, we're going from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. There's new physics in quantum mechanics. And so whether you, the answer is, is the right one for quantum mechanics or not is something you have to determine by experiment. The fact is, is that if you borrow this Hamiltonian into quantum mechanics, in some cases it's actually not so good. Uh, for example, for the case of an electron uh, in magnetic fields, you'll find that the energy levels aren't even qualitatively correct if you use this Hamiltonian. And the reason is, is because of the neglect of spin, which is, of course, a non-classical non effect. For a, for a spinless particle, it works better. So let's just say that, that adopting this Hamiltonian in quantum mechanics is a provisional step. Sometimes, it, sometimes it's all right. Later on, we'll consider uh, what, uh, the further physical effects that are needed to uh, we need to take into account in, in various situations. All right. So in quantum mechanics, then now this is our Hamiltonian. If you write the Schrodinger equation out now in a configuration representation as a uh, as a differential equation, you see it's now going to be this. The, the h psi equals i h bar e psi dt becomes, in more explicit form, it becomes minus i h bar gradient, the whole thing in the brackets, 1 over 2m, minus q over c times the vector potential a of x and t. This whole thing squared acts on psi of x and t. And you have plus q times the scalar potential, phi of x and t, multiplying psi of x and t is equal to i h bar b d t of psi of x and t. This is the kind of penetrating equation adopting this Hamiltonian uh, uh, for a particle moving in a three-dimension charged particle in three dimensions and uh, given, given, let's say, external electric and magnetic fields. Um, one of the questions that arises right away is what's the role of the choice of gauge? in the quantum problem. If the, again, the Hamiltonian is expressed in terms of potentials, not in terms of electric and magnetic fields, and the potentials are not unique. So what happens if we change the potentials from A to A, a and phi to A prime and phi prime? Does the Schrodinger equation give an invariant? Does it the same Schrodinger equation in the new gauge? Um, the answer is it isn't exactly invariant, it's what you call covariant. That means it has the same form in the new gauge as it had in the old gauge. Uh, but in order to achieve this covariance, in other words, to preserve the form of the equation, it's necessary not only to change the potentials for the electro electric and magnetic fields in terms of this gauge scalar, but it's also necessary to change the wave function. In fact, here's how the wave function transforms under a gauge transformation. This is the old wave function psi of x and t is equal to the new wave function I'll call psi prime of x and t times e to the i charge q gauge scalar f of x and t divided by h bar c. This is the gauge transformation of the wave function, which needs to be coupled with these transformations on the potential. All right. Now. Um, the, um, you just did a homework problem in which uh, one of the questions was to measure the phase of the wave function. Look what the gauge transformation does. Is it changes the phase of the wave function in a spatially dependent manner. In other words, the relative phases of the wave function at different spatial points, two points in space, I hope you know by now from that homework problem that um, that you can only measure the phase differences between the wave function at two different points in space. This is related to the fact that the overall phase of the wave function is non-physical. What you now see is that the relative phase in the wave function between two different spatial points actually depends on the gauge. It depends on your gauge convention for the, ga for the vector potential that you choose for the electromagnetic field. This is true for a charged particle. Q <coughs> is a charge here. Well, this seems crazy, but in fact, it's true. Uh, in that homework problem, we were thinking of, uh, of, of a situation where there was no, no magnetic field. In fact, it was really free particles. And so the implied gauge was never mentioned in the homework problem. The implied gauge was that A was equal to zero. And so the measurement process, that if you worked it out, which the right way to do it is to get it by a, a, double, a double hole experiment looking at interference, 
that double hole experiment is going to give you the phase of the wave function under this cage convention for a vanishing magnetic field. That's, the, that's the how it worked out. All right. Anyway, uh, I think I'm going to skip the algebra because it's entirely straightforward. However, I'll just say that if you take this change for psi, substitute this psi in here and everywhere else that you see, everywhere else you see in this equation on both sides, and you do the algebra, drive through the derivatives, there's the time derivative and the spatial derivatives, what you'll find is that there's a common factor, a phase factor like this that can be removed from the Schrodinger equation. And when you're done, you get a new equation in which the vector and the scalar potentials are prime, and so is the wave function. Everywhere it goes into its new equation like this. So this is what I mean by covariance. The Schrodinger equation maintains the same form. The algebra of this is contained in the notes, and it's, as I say, it's completely straightforward. I don't understand um, how, how this is possible. You should have, <coughs> sorry, we have a gauge choice. It should be something that, that like, all are true at the, at the same time. Like, any gauge choice is, is accurate. So how can a wave, how can the phase of the wave depend on the gauge choice that I made just to make my math easier? It's a good question. Um, if you think about, if you think about how this is actually related to, the, so you're asking how can the phase depend on this? Well, think about how you measure the phase of the wave function. In that homework problem, you measured it by having an interference. You had two holes here. You wanted to know the relative phase between two points on the screen, and the way to do it is to punch holes in the screen and then look at the inter so you have waves radiating out like this, and then you look at the interference pattern that's down here on the lower screen. You can by measuring the phase differences, you, you can get the difference in the phases. There. But in order to do this, you have a theory of propagation for how the waves move in this intermediate, intermediate region here. You need that in order to in order to count the phase difference in order to get the, the number get the number of wavelengths between along this segment and along this segment, subtracting the two, you get the phase difference in the two points. This is this is a, this is standard uh, interference between two holes. But as I say, you have to know how the waves are going to propagate in this region. Well, if you change the if you change the phase convention, let's say in that homework problem the implied phase convention, excuse me, change the gauge convention. In that homework problem, the implied gauge convention was that a is equal to zero because we didn't have any magnetic fields, so why not take a equals zero? And if you do this, then these waves are just spherical waves, and you, you get the elapsed phase just by counting the distance and dividing by the wavelength. The result of that should be the exact same thing as having a not equal a equal something else as long as b is kept zero. It should always be the same, right? But it's that not. But it's not. You'll find the phase is different if, you, if I put a non-zero vector potential. If I put a non-zero vector potential, a is not equal to zero, and we still have a magnetic field equal to zero, this implies that a is actually equal to the gradient of, of the gauge scalar. In that case, you'll find you have to take into account the elapsed amount of the elapsed a variation of the gauge scalar gap between these two points. And that's exactly what this is. How would you perform an experiment with what gauge You can't. But that's what you're proposing you can't. Do. You can't. But you need to you, but you, this but the experiment is not just an experiment in measuring something, it also involves a theory about how the wave propagates from that hole down to this lower screen. And you can't do that without having a theory of propagation. This is one of the ways why measuring wave functions in quantum mechanics is completely different from measuring a classical field, where all you do is just measure it. If you want to find the phase of an electromagnetic wave in classical E and M, you don't need to solve Maxwell's equations. You just go measure electric and magnetic fields. This is different. In fact, that was one of the points of that problem, just to emphasize that wave functions are, are not the same as, as people think they are, which is why they don't think about it very much, but wave functions the quantum wave function is not just some complex field out of space if you could go measure the psi meter or something. It doesn't like that at all. All right. All right. Uh, that's all for uh, <coughs> problems with, electric, with magnetic fields for now. We'll come back to them and actually deal with them in considerably more detail in, in a few more lectures down the line. But right now, I want to address uh, a few other issues. Uh, one of them is I'd like to uh, tell you about just some uh, simple matters involving solving the Schrodinger, uh, simple matters that arise when you solve Schrodinger equation in one-dimensional problems. 
Well, let's take just simple 1D problems here. I wanted to make just a few comments about the Schrodinger equation. In fact, this is going to be the time-independent Schrodinger equation. So it's kinetic energy plus potential energy times psi is equal to a total energy psi. This is the problem of finding an energy eigenfunction in one dimension. The first question I'd like to address is the question of degeneracies. Uh, when do we have degeneracies in one-dimensional problems like this? So to begin with, let's suppose we have a solution psi of this equation, which I just wrote down. And let's suppose we have another solution, which I'll call <coughs> phi, of the same equation. Uh, if these two solutions are linearly independent, then we have a degeneracy. Uh, to analyze what, when this is possible, let's take the first equation and multiply it by phi, and the second equation and multiply it by psi, and then subtract the two. And if you can do this, you see you get phi psi phi psi on both potential energy and the total energy terms. So when you subtract those drop out, and all that's left are the second derivative terms, where there's a common factor of minus h bar squared over 2m. So doing this fraction, what you get is that phi times psi double prime minus psi times phi double prime is equal to zero. This, however, is also equal to the derivative with respect to x of a quantity we call w, I'll call w. w is given a name, it's called the Vronsky end of the equation. And in fact, what it's equal to is phi times psi prime minus psi times phi prime, now with only one derivative. If you take the derivative of this, you get second derivatives on these second terms, and then the derivatives of the first terms cancel. So it turns into this. This is an exact derivative. This can also, by the way, be written as a determinant as phi phi prime in the first row and psi psi prime in the second row. Anyway, the point of this is that the Ronskian has a derivative which is equal to zero, so the Ronskian is a function of x, so a constant. All right. <coughs> now, let's suppose, so this is always true if I have any two solutions of the one-dimensional Schrodinger equation. Now, let's suppose that we have uh, psi of x zero is equal, let's suppose for this one, let's suppose that there exists some x zero such that psi of x zero is equal to phi of x zero equals zero. In other words, let's suppose that the solutions vanish at the same point x zero. Where this happens is typically due to boundary conditions. If you have, for example, a hard wall like this, the wave functions have to go psi and phi. They both have to go to zero at the same point x zero, which is the wall. Another place where this might happen is if you have a potential energy V of x, which is a well, like this. And then you know you've got it. Here's, if here's an energy like this, then you know you've got a wave function that rises and oscillates like this. And then outside, the classically, uh, out into the classically forbidden region, it dies off exponentially. So this is a place where the wave function has to go to zero, both psi and phi go to zero as x goes to plus or minus infinity. This point x zero could be at infinity. It doesn't, doesn't matter. So long as this condition holds at some point x zero, this implies that the Ronskian is equal to zero because the Ronskian is the quote psi and phi are zero at any given point in the whole Ronskian is zero. So this implies that w is equal to zero. But this implies since W is this quantity here, it implies that phi psi prime is equal to psi phi prime. And that implies that psi prime over psi is equal to phi prime over phi. That implies that the logarithm of psi is equal to the logarithm of phi plus a constant. And that implies taking exponentials that psi is equal to c times phi. And so what you see is, is that under this condition, which I'll now box here, this implies that there is no degeneracy because any two solutions are necessarily proportional to one another. No degeneracy. And so in particular, if you've got a hard wall problem, or if you've got a problem where the wave function is a bound state <coughs> so that it dies off exponentially outside the well, 
then these are necessarily non-degenerate solutions in one dimension. In fact, it doesn't have to die off to, infinity, to zero at both infinities. It just dies off at one infinity. That's enough to make it, uh, to make it uh, a non-degenerate. So to give you another example, if I can get enough room here to do it, uh, let's suppose I've got a potential energy that looks like this. Here's x, here's v of x. Let's suppose potentially is mostly zero to negative x, but then it rises up like this. So it's a mountain of the particles being scattered against, and you've got an energy like this coming in. Well, in this case, the way it oscillates like this, it gets up towards the turning point, and then it dies off exponentially into the classically forbidden region of this direction. So here the wave function goes to zero as x goes to plus infinity, not to minus infinity. It's still enough. It still means there's no degeneracy. So it's true for bound states, but it may also be true for unbound states if the wave function dies off at infinity or if there's a hard wall. Then there'll be no degeneracy. Uh, on the other hand, suppose the wave function does not have any boundary conditions of force at zero, then is it possible that we do have degeneracies? And the answer is yes, because uh, let's just take the case of a free particle, which is doing this forever, it's back to the side. Yes, In this case, uh, for a free particle, you know there's two solutions, either the ikx and either the minus ikx. These have the same energy, uh, but they are but they are linearly independent, so you do have degeneracy. They have the same energy, linearly independent, therefore there is a degeneracy. So when the conditions of this of this uh, theorem are not met, then you may have degeneracies. Yes. Shouldn't, shouldn't um, every way, every normal life Yes, but uh, for yes, but for unbound wave functions of positive energy, such as in the case of the free particle, they don't die off. Those are not normalizable, by the way. But this one is also an unbound wave function, and it's not degenerate because it dies off at one infinity. All right. Now, here's another little theorem. Non-degenerate wave function psi in one dimension, which is most of what we're talking, we're talking about up here, uh, can be chosen to be real. When I say can be chosen, uh, you can always, of course, uh, choose the phase, overall phase of the wave function. And I mean by choosing the overall phase, if by some algorithm psi came out to be non non uh, came out to be complex you could eliminate the complex numbers just by multiplying by an overall phase factor. This is related to this earlier result here. What one needs to show is that both psi and psi star, if there's a non-degeneracy, they satisfy the same Schrodinger equation because the Schrodinger equation is real. And uh, by the theorem up above, if, if they're, if they're non-degenerate, they're proportional to one another, and one can show that by factoring on a phase factor, you can make them real. I'm not going to go through the details of this because, uh, number one, it's in the notes, and number two, it's a special case of the reality of wave functions when systems are invariant and are time reversal. And this is something we'll delve into uh, in, in more generality later in the semester. So right now, I just want to mention the result. You see, by the way, that in this degenerate case here, the wave function is not real. It's, in fact, complex. Although you can make linear combinations, to get real wave functions if you want. However, uh, when the theorem above does apply so that you've got non-degenerate wave functions, then you can choose them to be real. So bound state wave functions in one-dimensional wells, you can always make psi real. Those are the main things I wanted to say about some topics in one-dimensional wave mechanics. Next, I'd like to make a beginning, uh, in the time that's left this hour, a WKD theory, which will occupy us some, a lecture or more. 
So let's talk about W to B theory. WKB theory, for our purposes, and in quantum mechanics in general, really has two roles. One of them is that it provides a conceptual framework for understanding the classical limit of quantum mechanics. Um, at the Ehrenfest, uh, uh, the Ehrenfest relations, which I described earlier in the hour, are another way of, of understanding the classical limit about the evolution of wave packets following classical orbits and some approximation. Uh, WKB theory is actually uh, deeper and more so it's a more sophisticated theory, and uh, it gives us more insight into the uh, relation between uh, classical and quantum mechanics. There's a second purpose of WKB theory, which is that it allows you to um, approximate the solutions of a quantum problem in, in uh, terms of uh, uh, in terms of the classical solutions. And this is what we'll see. Now, if, uh, the, uh, these are what you might call the practical applications of WKB theory. These practical applications are usually restricted to one-dimensional problems. Uh, the multi-dimensional problems are more sophisticated, so we won't go, go into them in this course. So I'm going to make this lecture primarily, and the following lectures primarily on the one-dimensional case, with just a few mentions of the three-dimensional case. The notes have a little bit more on the three-dimensional case. So first of all, let me uh, describe for you in, in, uh, in pictorial and qualitative terms when the WKD approximation is valid. Uh, so I'm talking about one of the only for now. So to begin with, let's suppose we have a potential energy V as a function of X. And by the way, the equation we'll be interested in solving is just the one-dimensional Schrodinger equation. So we'll do this one. The simple equation. <coughs> All right, uh, let's suppose we have a potential energy which roughly looks something like this. It has some change of potential like that. Um, then, under many circumstances, the wave function, psi, sketched on the, on the same x-axis, looks something like this. There's, first of all, an envelope, which I'll make with kind of a dotted line. It makes an arc like this. I can draw this very well. And then inside the envelope, there is oscillations that go back and forth and fill in the envelope like this. There are many circumstances in, in uh, one-dimensional quantum mechanics when you get solutions that look like this. I'm really thinking of a time-independent case, but this also is true for time-dependent case as well. Now, let's say that the potential energy here has got some typical scale length, which something like it's a length over which the potential varies significantly. So let's call L as the scale length of the potential. The wave function, on the other hand, has these oscillations which have their, their wavelength, which is lambda is the wavelength of the oscillations. By the way, to go back to the scale length L, the scale length L is, is, is the length over which the potential varies. Now, um, the, um, under many circumstances I'm sketching here, the, uh, the wave function has the form of a modulated wave. It's kind of like an FM wave signal. And the envelope of the wave has the same scale length as the potential itself, just the way I sketched it here. On the other hand, the wavelength of, of individual oscillations is a much shorter scale than I've drawn here. It's, it's lambda. Now, by the de Broglie relation, if we use the de Broglie relation, lambda is the same thing as 2 pi h bar over an associated momentum p. The de Broglie relation is usually thought of in terms of, of uh, plane waves or free particle solutions, which is not what we're talking about here. Uh, for a free particle solution, the momentum is a constant. Here, however, this wavelength actually changes as you move from one part of this envelope to another. In fact, the wavelength lambda has the same scale length as L. It, slowly, it changes slowly on the scale of L. And so what this means is the momentum when computes by the de Broglie relation is actually a function of x. So this thing implies that there is some momentum function of x, let's say p equals p of x, which is associated with this a wave function of this type. One of the things we want to do is to understand what is the meaning of this momentum function, momentum as a, as a function of position. We'll see this come out in just a moment. All right. Now, the next thing we'd like to do is to write down what we call a WKB ansatz, which is 
a representation of a wave function that is a slowly modulating wave function that looks like this. So I'll write psi of x in terms of an amplitude I'll call a of x, which we understand to be slowly varying. Uh, slowly varying means on the scale of the capital L. Multiply times a rapidly varying phase, which I'll write as exponential of e to the i times the function s of x over h bar. Now let me explain why I put s of e, let me explain why I put this phase factor for a rapidly varying phase. In the first place, the WKB approximation is going to be valid when the de Broglie wavelength is much less than the scale length of the potential. Those are the conditions of validity on the WKB approximation. This is, of course, the same thing as 2 pi h bar divided by this momentum p is much less than L. Or equivalently, it's 2 pi h bar is much less than p times L. Now, sometimes the way people state this is they say WKB approximation is valid if h bar is quote unquote small. I put this in quotes because h bar is not a dimensionless number, and its numerical value depends on the units you use. If you use typical macroscopic units like grams, centimeters, and seconds, then h bar indeed has a small value, numerical value, but uh, you can invent other units in which it's got a large value. So there is no absolute meaning too small. However, it, it is useful to compare h bar to other quantities that have the dimensions of action, such as the momentum times the length. If you think of a momentum and length here as being classical quantities, this length is a classical quantity because it's a scale length of the potential. And the conditions of validity in WKB theory are that uh, actions that occur in the classical problem are, are, are much larger than, than h bar. And in fact, this is normally what you'd expect in the classical limit uh, of ordinary classical systems, which are measured typically in terms of grams and centimeters and so on. Well, the small value of h bar means that classical actions are small. So the small h bar limit is equivalent to a classical limit. Now, um, let me proceed a little further with this. Uh, this uh, explain explain why this phase factor here represents the rapidly varying phase, like we see in this picture over here. Let's consider the change in a phase that appears here, s of x over h bar. Let's consider the change in the phase over a single wavelength lambda. Well, that change has to be 2 pi because that's an advance of 2 pi of, of, of a single wave. So let's say so this holds when delta x is equal to lambda. But if we take this s of x and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, expand, expand it out just using it this first derivative, then the left-hand side is approximately the same thing as s prime of, s prime of x times lambda divided by h bar, and that's equal to 2 pi. And so the result of this is, is that s prime of x is equal to 2 pi h bar over lambda. And you'll see that's the same thing, exactly the same thing as this momentum function p of x, which was emerging by using the de Broglie relation on these, on these waves here. So uh, this now gives us an interpretation of this function s of x, is that its, it's derivative is this momentum function, which we still need to interpret what it is but uh, it connects this momentum function with the phase of the wave function there. Okay, so that's, that's all for today. We'll continue in the next time.